Um, welcome everyone. This is our number six uh, lecture. Not we won't call it a lecture. But we call it talks from our startup talks, um, and um, we're really happy to have Paul Stafford here. Um, and welcome, Paul. Thanks for taking time. Uh, and uh, those of you who don't know Paul Stafford, very few of you will, but uh, uh, those who don't, he, uh, you might know his brands, the brands he created together with his design studio, uh, because he is the CA CEO and the co-founder of Design Studio, a design, obviously, design company that uh, works in, or uh, has branches in London mainly, and then in New York, and in San Francisco, and in even Sydney, I read. Yeah. So that's great. And you're only 10 years old, uh, right. yeah? And so many, so many subsidiaries and so many branches all over the world. Fantastic. But uh, if you know his, the, the brands he created, you will understand why there should be quite a few branches. Um, and uh, you all know the Airbnb. Uh, brand uh, and that's your work, you and your team. Uh, but it's not only that. A, a lot of uh, modern companies and a lot of uh, brands you have created. You, you've been working to, with tw for Twitter and for the UEFA and for yes. the Premier League. I read so quite a bit. And this is obviously a very good reason why we invited you to talk about what makes a brand successful. Um, and I think the, this is again something I have read about what you said. This is a, a brand is successful if it changes changes the behavior of, peoples, of people. Um, and, but that's probably only a, a little part of it. Uh, and we are very eager to learn more and to learn how, um, how, much, uh, how important it is. Uh, the, 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 the business about creating a brand, how much that is part of creating a business altogether. It's a, it's a fraction of it, but it's very, very important. Um, and I know you love your work and, uh, and uh, what you take from your work, and I have a little quote and then we can start it. Um, as you were saying, um, the agency creates work that aims to make a meaningful difference, build loyalty, drive growth, and connect communities across every aspect of the brand experience. And I think that puts it out nicely. Uh, and um, your stage. Perfect. Off. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. So um, I've been told this is it's quite a nice kind of uh, small kind of forum. So apparently this is going to be interactive. So I do welcome you to kind of like, ask me questions. It's quite hard to kind of listen to me drone on for an hour and then remember the question you had about slide two. So if you do have a question, I guess put your hand up. I'll, I'll try and answer it. If it's too many, I might just ignore them, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, I am here to talk about this, the creation of a successful brand, which is quite hard to kind of say, well, what is a successful brand? But I'll try and answer it as we kind of go through, through the kind of presentation. I think what I really want to do today is maybe show you how we kind of work, who we've worked with, how I think you do create a successful brand. And it is my opinion. Um, it's how I built my company and what I think we do and how we work with brands. So um, you'll probably see different branding agencies may say it in different ways. But you know, I think I'll use something like Airbnb as a good example. And the reason it's good to use someone like Airbnb and maybe not one that we're working on right now is that brand isn't like an instant thing. You know, it takes time. And when we're changing those behaviors, you know, people need to learn those behaviors. So it does take time. And we've had a few years. The Airbnb has now been out for around five years. So it has impacted the business. I've changed it. So we can go through it, show you what we did, and maybe show you the impact of what I think is a successful brand. But first of all, who are we? I mean, we, we guessed that hopefully some of you know who we are. I'd hope you, you clicked on something to figure out why you're coming along to this today. Um, and you're right, we, we mentioned it in the, in the kind of like wrap up of, of me and Design Studio. We make a meaningful difference um, to some of the world's most loved brands. I, I'll pack that slightly in a moment. But you know, um, We've worked with a lot of brands. We are only 10 years old. Uh, lots of people do talk about Airbnb, um, but and Deliveroo, I don't know if you know them. They're, um, they're based in the UK and kind of globally as well. The Premier League, of course, very exciting. And then very recently, the UEFA Champions League. You know, all very, very exciting brands. But it's not just those brands that we really want to work with. Um, because those brands, you know, it's not easy, but they're very exciting. They're kind of like, you know, they're, they're on a huge trajectory, really fast growth. And you kind of walk in and you kind of like caught up in the energy of walking into those businesses. But, you know, when we're helping change behaviors, you know, some of those behaviors are because brands are in a negative place. And I think a good example of that is working with somebody like Logitech, um, which you could look at as one of the original tech startups. You know, they've been around about 35, 40 years and they just lost their way. 
But we love working with people like that as well, where we can go in, we can kind of figure out well, why have they lost their way? Why have they kind of feel like they're, they, they kind of used to be relevant to 25 year olds, but now those 25 year olds are 55 year olds. And how do we get them back to, to kind of being, um, I don't know, re-energized and feel like they, they should be kind of living in the worlds of Apple and should be reconnecting, I guess, with you guys and you thinking their products are cool. So how do we help them do that? Um, and there's a few myths which I'm gonna go through and dispel as we go through the presentation, because I think lots of people come to us and say, well, that's it, we just want a logo like Airbnbs and that'll solve everything. And it's not that. Um, and what it is, is meaningful difference. And I'll talk about what that is a little bit more. But the thing that connects all of these clients, and this is whether they are brand new, whether they're exciting, whether they are an Airbnb, whether they are a Logitech, is that they have to have ambition. Um, and that means like making a change. So whether Airbnb's ambition, which was really, you know, to, to, to put listings on the moon and let people kind of travel the world in a completely unique way, or whether that's Logitech's ambition to kind of, you know, change things so they can, they can shift and uh, start associating themselves with, you know, those younger target audiences. You know, the ambition means that they have to kind of deliver on it. If we come in and say, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we reconnect with those people, the business has to really believe in making significant changes to do it. It's not just a kind of new, fresh lick of paint. It needs fundamental changes to do it. Okay, so I've talked a few times, and I was introduced with this term about meaningful difference, but, but what does that mean? Well, I kind of sum it up as it's really what makes a brand truly amazing. Um, you know, you will associate with certain brands, and it's not because of their logo. It's probably because of their products, but there's also something, there might be a competitor for that product that's almost exactly the same, but you associate with one over the other. And that's that meaningful difference. It's something that they do that plays a bigger role in your life, that makes you kind of consciously or subconsciously make a choice out of the two or the three. Um, and that is what we do. We try and figure out what that is. And it's, it's a kind of long, lengthy process. But that's really, I think, the magic of what Design Studio do is we can figure that out. We can help find it, we can help package it up, and then we can help communicate it to people. And it's only then that we can kind of start figuring out, well, what do we need to do? What do we need to change to tell people what makes us amazing? So it's a truth, and you may have heard some of these buzzwords. I mean, we call it meaningful difference. Um, I think lots of companies in the terminology you may have heard is that you know, a, it's a core proposition, it's a, it's a purpose. But basically, it's what I kind of said earlier. It's really about that role in the lives that the brand plays. And so we have to figure that out. And I'll give you some examples in case this is slightly confusing. This is like brand 101, so let's dig into it. So here are three, I guess, purposes or propositions from companies. Let's see if we can figure out who they are. They're pretty easy. So number one, this is the proposition for this company, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And there's a beautiful little asterisk here that then says, if you have a body, you're an athlete. Anybody? Nobody. Mike? Yeah, okay, good one. Um, <laughs> that's it, you know, I'm wearing some. It was coming to a pointing clue uh, in a minute. But um, yeah, so it's not about, uh, they don't have a proposition which is like, we make cool trainers or we make trendy kind of like uh, athletic wear. It's not about that. It's something that sits above it and the role they play in people's lives is actually they're here to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And what's brilliant about that asterisk is obviously they're saying, it doesn't matter if you are kind of like running 25 marathons a year or whether you're actually just going to decide to get up off your sofa a little bit more at the weekends. They see that if you have a body, you're an athlete and they should figure out how they can build innovation, technology, products that can kind of suit you wherever you are. Okay, second one. And this might be easier in this kind of room. Build technology so simple that everybody can be part of the future. Apple, Apple yeah, I've picked some obvious ones for you. Um, it's Apple. You know, they don't talk about laptops. They don't talk about phones. Um, and it's, it's not even the taglines that you always probably think that that is what their, their purpose is. It's, it's that. It's to kind of look at technology in a different way. And you can see it through everything that they do. They don't just look at technology and talk about processes. They don't just talk about the kind of screen size. They try and figure out, well, how do we show how it changes or kind of like how it benefits you in your real life? And how do we make it really simple? And I'm going to show you how, you know, that allows them to do different things than just make laptops and screens. And then the final one, I'll give you a clue with this one, it's one that we built. So create a world where people can belong anywhere. Airbnb. Airbnb, there it is. Yeah, so Airbnbs again, you know, they didn't have this before they came to us, but I'll show you how we got to that. You know, Airbnb's uh, proposition isn't about just finding great unique listings or enabling you to travel to, to like, I think they're in every country in the world bar one. It's, a, it's about something that's a higher purpose, which is like to make you feel actually that you can travel differently and belong anywhere in the world. 
So I'm going to kind of show you what these do uh, and how they allow companies to write differently and why it's great to have that meaningful difference because it means that actually it can align things that you do in the future and how it should almost be a lens for absolutely every decision that you make. You should think, well, how does it point back to this? And how does every interaction, everything that we build or communicate to somebody point back to this? So let's look at Nike. Now, what this allows them to do is that they're not just stuck making trainers. Um, they are they can innovate anything around that kind of purpose, which means that you know, when the fuel band came out, it meant that this was a piece of technology that could track every single movement that I made. And it didn't matter what kind of level of movement I was making. It didn't matter if I was that athlete running all those marathons or I'm me that's pretty much lazy and just kind of walks to and from work occasionally. You know, it meant that that's the way they could look at it. They could make life, everything that you do, a sport, and it doesn't matter who you are. So it's a fantastic way of looking at like how that kind of takes them into a different product territory that isn't their kind of normal products, and it still feels right. Apple, I think, you know, it's, it's obvious that they can go from iPads to phones to laptops, but when you think about the proposition, it's not just the technology or the product. It's got to be almost every way that you can interact with the brand. So when Apple have a proposition like this, it means that, you know, they even have to think about, well, how do we redefine even how you go into one of our stores. How do we change the way that that works? Um, how do we do it differently to what currently people are doing? Now, you guys are probably a lot younger than me, so you don't really remember because Apple have changed it and now everyone follows it. But when you used to go in to interact with any type of product or laptop, they were behind huge glass boxes and always. And Apple realized that actually, if we're gonna kind of demonstrate to everybody that technology is simple, that you should understand it, it should be intuitive, then you should walk into a store these devices should be there for you to play on. They're all online. You can actually send emails from them. You can learn about them. You, you can use them. You can work on them. And that was a completely huge kind of like step away from what everyone else in this space was doing. But that's because they have that proposition. It allowed them to think differently about how that one execution just in retail was. But of course, everything else that they do also goes through that filter as well. And Airbnb, which I'm going to go through a lot uh, in a lot more detail so you can see how we got to that. But you know, they. I think at the beginning, when, when they first approached us, they were running campaigns which were basically saying, you know, you can stay in X place for X amount. And then Home Away, who were their biggest competitor, would come out and say, well, you can stay in Y place for Y amount. And so then they'd change tact and they would come out with a different story about, yeah, but we've got unique places that you can stay in. And then guess what? Home Away would do exactly the same thing. So what this allows Airbnb to do is like have a completely different message that if there's a real truth behind their business, that the others can't really copy. Not in a real way, people would kind of see through it. And if everybody really believed this, they can talk completely differently through their messaging about creating campaigns that are just about creating one less stranger in the world. Because that backs up, if we want to feel that we can travel the world, belong anywhere in it, if we all go and make friends with just one more person, we'll kind of make that world feel a little bit more like we can belong there. So their messaging completely changed, and, and it doesn't talk even about their, their core product, it just talks about their, their bigger belief. So this, this is, Every single time uh, I have a new business meeting, well, not every time, most times I have a new business meeting, um, this is what people think branding is. It's just the logo. And that's why I said right at the beginning, people come into me and say, yeah, we want to be like Airbnb, so can you just make something like this for us? And that'll do it. We'll be a $31 billion company. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's absolutely not these things. These really are just these, these kind of like small items that you identify, and when you see them, you actually associate everything those companies do to them. I think everyone always thinks the Nike logo is the most incredible logo in the world. It's, it's, it's not. It actually could be anything. If, if Nike did everything else that they're currently doing, but it was a different logo, you would think that logo was the coolest thing. It's because what they're doing makes you kind of resonate and feel, like, um, feel that that's the coolest logo there is. And it's the same with Apple. It's because it sits on those products. It's because it kind of works the way it does. It's because it has that amazing belief from its founder. That's what you kind of see when you see that mark. So the way we kind of talk to clients when they come in to see us about what branding is and, and what logos are, we say, well, logos aren't really anything. They're just a full stop at the end of the story. The story is what people believe in. The story is the brand. The story is the thing you read. The story is the thing you love. And then right at the very end, there's this full stop. And then you just kind of, every time you see that, you just remember it. And it kind of triggers that, that kind of thought process about the brand. And then the second common mistake Beyond the logo is this, this is branding. Um, and these are the taglines. Now, these have a lot to do with that kind of spirit again of the company. So you can see really, after I've showed you those kind of propositions, how these are kind of like shorthand for it. But again, it works in a similar way of the logo. These are P 
pieces of marketing communication that people assign to advertising that then give you that kind of spirit. But the Just Do It really is just a campaign that they run from the marketing that really makes you feel that attitude of like, if you have a body, you're an athlete. It just builds upon that. And think different is the same thing. If, if we're going to kind of make sure that technology is different, if, we, if people can use it, if we're going to look at how we can kind of, people can intuitively kind of learn about our products rather than it being all about technology, then we need to think completely differently from everybody else. And Belong Anywhere, we always kind of recommended that they didn't turn it into, into a tagline. But, you know, because we, these shouldn't be external things. They should just be something that's internal in the company and drives all the values and what you do. But actually Airbnb, was so clear that this is what they stood for. They wanted to actually create the shorthand, which was just to belong anywhere to push through into their, to their marketing apps and campaigns. But it's the same. It's not the brand. These are just small components. A brand is every single thing that your company does and every way that a person can engage with your company. Are we clear on what propositions are? I've had no questions yet. Here we go. Is it, is it like a vision or mission? Or yeah. There's, there's a lot of bullshit in branding, and you will hear all of these words. And they're great ways to sell my product to people and keep charging you for it. So here's your mission, here's your vision, here's your proposition, your purpose, your values, here's your pyramid, here's your brand onion. Um, one of the reasons I went to start this business was because it's so confusing. Really, what you need is something that is like a, a marker that is something that captures what you believe something that sets you apart from everybody else, or something that captures it in a way that you can say it really quickly and really clearly. It can't be, you can't be talking for half an hour to explain what your position is and what your role is to somebody. So that's what the proposition is. It's just something that kind of wraps that up very clearly so that everyone can rally behind it and understand exactly what that business stands for. Uh, and a mission's a similar thing. Very, you know, it's just a different articulation of that. Um, and, and then taglines are just shorter articulations of that. But it should be really clear. You, a company should only have one of these things or it becomes really confusing. Yeah, but to be honest, you need more than just like the three words or the or the five words that you have in the um, in the proposition. You need, yeah. also need like assisting values or assisting so, like, frameworks. So, they, but they all point to this. I think is my point. So you're right. You're absolutely right. So Airbnb have ten company values that back up this, but they all point to that. Now, what they don't do, and I think this is the, this is why I try to reduce the complexity of what we're delivering to people, is that saying that this stands over here, company values are quite different, and, and sit alongside them. They have to point to the same thing. You know, they have to be about whatever our values are. Have to believe in the idea that we're creating a world where people can belong anywhere, and this is the way we do it. So it tears out from that point. Is, is kind of what I'm saying. Anything else? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so what I'm going to do you have a do you have an example for? I mean, Nike is, uh, is a company that is doing product, Apple as well, and I mean, uh, Airbnb is offering a service. What about like a consultancy? Uh, would they also have like a similar? Yeah. I mean, it's easy with these because I think that the reason I, I kind of bring these products up is because people, are, people know these brands and they probably interact with them in lots and lots of different ways. But yeah, most, a lot of companies do. Like we work with Sage and they, they have a similar kind of like proposition, which I can't remember off the top of my head. But a lot of the companies we work with and a lot of those companies like Logitech, et cetera, that we put at the beginning, they all have these propositions that then kind of like change exactly what they do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you go on a website actually and look through some of the kind of case studies, you'll see really how it doesn't matter what type of business. We work in so many different types of business. You'll see how it always has the same process of trying to figure out what is that meaningful difference behind. Okay, so how do we figure that out? How do we figure out what this meaningful difference is for those brands? Well, here's another mistake that I think a lot of companies used to make. Um, and one of the reasons I started, started the business is because I found that, you know, you had to kind of turn up pretending you knew everything about a business that you're working for, and I think it's the wrong way. Um, and I think one of the harshest lessons you could have was probably with Airbnb and somebody like Brian Chesky. If, if we'd have turned up to kind of say to, um, to, say to our, uh, Brian Chesky, you know, that Airbnb is, is what I've kind of read on your Wikipedia page, I think he'd have gone crazy. You know, his, his kind of ambition for what he wanted the business to be was nowhere near how they were summarizing his business in a very kind of like functional way uh, on Wikipedia. So how do we do it? Um, Oh, actually, this is the other thing that Airbnb were doing at the time as well. So this is the other way that you can, you can walk in as an expert is to kind of go on their website and do some digging. Now, when we first went on Airbnb's website, um, this is what it used to look like. Do any of you even remember this looking like this? Um, and that was how they summed themselves up. Find a place to stay. So you can see that you can see the issue they got here is actually in this in this marketplace where they were doing something different. It fundamentally was different. It was started with a belief from Brian and from Joe uh, of like we want to change the way people travel. 
But that doesn't, that doesn't capture that. That is actually something that any single company in this space could say. Any hospitality brand could say, find a place to stay. And not just the home aways who were their big competitor at the time, but Hilton Group, Intercontinental Group. Any of these kind of brands could actually just say that. So we ha we, you, there's no way you could walk into Airbnb saying, we absolutely understand your business, even by looking at their own website. They haven't even figured out themselves how to articulate what their meaningful difference is yet. So we go in quite brave, I think, at the beginning. Um, because it doesn't give that much reassurance when you walk in and say, we know nothing. Um, but I think it's completely the best way to be. And I think it's the only way to, to kind of be when you're working with any brand is to not pretend that you know. I and mean, so we worked with the Premier League. Um, and I've watched the Premier League probably since being about five or six years old. And I probably feel like I know it inside out. But actually, I don't want to bring my opinions of what the Premier League is or how the Premier League works to the project. I want to try and forget everything. And I want to learn. So we have to completely delve into how do we learn? And that's by starting by knowing nothing and trying to do everything to learn about, well, what is it about this brand that makes it special? And these are actually some photos before we even won the project. These are actually from the pitch. And um, Joe was actually flying over, Joe Gabriel, one of the founders, was flying over from San Francisco um, and coming to London for the pitch meeting. And they'd given us the project that asked us to um, rebrand hospitality. And we did a great job. It, it looked beautiful. And I, I knew that everyone was going to be doing the same thing. They were going to be kind of looking at, well, what does hospitality mean? How do we create an identity for it? How does it change all of our marketing and messaging, et cetera? And we did a good job on that. But really, I wanted to show the design studio spirit of saying we know nothing, but we're going to learn. And so what we did was we built a listing in our studio. So we took out all the furniture, and we kind of brought in things from home that we had. We brought in like a, a cheap bed that someone had that they'd, uh, they'd not unpacked yet from Ikea. All the designers brought in their kind of furnishings. These wall clocks were all brought in. And we tried to learn about well, what it's like to, to be a host and a guest on Airbnb. So we, we kitted it out ready for breakfast. So that when they came in, we welcomed them as hosts would welcome them. We brought in things that you don't get in hotels. So these are the things we're trying to figure out. Well, why is it different? Like the difference in a hotel is it's all going to be, I'm going to go into every single room. It's going to feel the same. It's going to feel perfectly the same. That's not going to happen if you come and stay in my house. You're going to drink out of my Mr. Happy mug. This is a very different way of, of experiencing travel. So we tried to kind of build this as well. And then we put it on the site. Um, it was pricey at $2,000. Uh, but, but, you know, we've got central London location. It's, it's a good place to be. Uh, so we, we, put it on the, um, we put it on the site as well. And uh, we tried to learn, well, well how are we going to kind of figure out what, what Airbnb's meaningful difference is? So that's how we start. We start by saying, well, actually, we know nothing, but we're willing to learn. And, it, and obviously, I mean, we won that job. Um, and, and really, I think we won it more on the fact that that was our attitude and approach. And it sit, it, it sit really well with kind of like their approach to how they wanted to work with an agency. They didn't want some experts to come in and say, we've been doing this for 20, 30 years, and this is how we're going to create this brand. Because they were like, well, we've not been doing Airbnb for 20, 30 years, and we don't want something that the Hilton Group do. We want to work in a completely different way. So I think it really resonated quite well with them. So we kind of came to the approach and, and showed them that we were, we were in this listing. And I think Brian was very confused because he dialed in from uh, San Francisco and couldn't realize why his uh, business partner was sprawled across a bed uh, in the middle of a kind of London studio. But I think it was once he figured out, once he was told why, they realized that we were the right people to work with. And this is what we said to them. We want to learn from the experts. And the experts aren't people really just that are in hospitality. They aren't the people that are doing this for a long time. The people that, who are the experts are actually, you know, the people who work there. And that's how we learn. You know, it's, it's the founders. We want to learn, well, why do they start this business? Where's this business going in the future? What, why is it? What do you stand in opposition to? I want to talk to people that are there, like the employees, of course. You know, some of them have quit jobs and just joined because of a mission, or because of a belief that this thing is going to be incredible. Even though they don't quite know what it's going to be yet, they've joined for that and they've joined for that culture. So we need to talk to these people about that. We want to talk to the people that are the newest. We want to talk to the oldest. We want to kind of figure out, you know, the differences between them. We want to talk to the customers. We will talk to absolutely everyone just to figure out, you know, what is it that makes this brand special? And I think, again, a lot of people think these are the people we talk to. So this very small group of the, maybe the chief design officer, if you have one, definitely the CMO, the marketing officer, and then just those teams. And that's so far from the truth. 
you know, that is not what brand is again. That is again, is just about marketing communication. When we talk to people, it has to be absolutely everyone. And this is just internally, but um, we have to do this massively externally as well. But, you know, we need to talk to the investors, you know, what is it they're hoping from this, which is usually return on their money. But some of them really want to play a pivotal role in this business. Why do they invest in this business in the first place? The board's really interesting as well that we need to talk to. The CEO, I'll talk about again later, is absolutely fundamental to this project. Um, and then everyone across the business, and I, I just kind of typed a few out, but this could go on and on and on. Anyone who works there, we have to kind of talk to you. We have to kind of learn why they work there, what do they do, and how can the brand actually help them? Or how can it kind of like change something that's not potentially working for them at the minute? But this guy really has to be part of the project. Um, and it might not be a CEO, it might, it might be the person who's driving the kind of business and the vision for the business. Um, because I'll show you at the end, it's so important that when we reintroduce this to the business at the end, that it doesn't just come from an agency from London, it has to come from the CEO. When he stands on the stage and talks about this is what our company stands for, this is our purpose, it has to be truth and it has to come from him. So it's really fundamental that they're involved. It can't be coming from just the marketing team. So when we're kind of interviewing people, um, we try and go through what we call the five C's. And we go a lot wider than this, if, I, if, I, if I'm completely honest. But you know, these are some of the things that we're looking to check and looking to kind of question. It's like, what's the culture of the business? I think this is really important. You know, what we're looking for is like, why, why is this business different? Why, how is this brand going to help attract the right talent in the future? How do we capture the culture that they have now? And again, for someone like Urban Beauty, it was hugely important. They, they wanted to feel like a startup. They were growing massively. There was about 40 people joining every Monday that I was there, and they were really kind of intent on not losing that culture of feeling different, feeling unique, feeling like a startup. So how do we do that through the brand? Um, capabilities, they're another thing as well. Um, there's no point us building a set of tools or a brand that a company cannot implement because they don't have the capabilities to do it. So what we need to figure out is, well, one, are we going to build a brand that this company can deliver right now? Or two, are we going to build a brand that actually we need to change the team. And that was a great example with Logitech. You know, their shift from engineering focus really to design focus meant huge changes in the business. It meant actually kind of like chopping a lot of people out of the business and bringing in a lot of new people. And so they did bring in a chief design officer uh, and a product officer, which was a guy called Alistair Curtis. And that was a huge change that had to back up the brand, which goes back to that point about there needs to be an ambition behind what you're doing. You need to back it up and make these changes. One other thing on the culture as well is we, we have to change the way we do the, um, the projects. So you can imagine a Premier League are very different people to an Airbnb. The Premier League are old guys wearing suits um, who don't really represent the, the fans of the Premier League, if I'm honest. Um, but we couldn't run the same meetings, the same workshops with them as we did with Airbnb. Um, I think Brian was a perfect example of somebody that actually, you know, he's got a design background. He, if, if it wasn't visual, if it wasn't him drawing, sketching, thinking in a creative way, I just saw his phone come out of his pocket and him start scrolling through Instagram. He just like literally zoned out of the project instantly. Um, so we, we, we had to change, you know, we need to ask questions, we need to dig deep, we need to talk about the vision, but we can't do it through just sitting there with a clipboard and, and a few kind of questions. So we were, we were getting him to draw things, to kind of like figure out storyboards of what the future of Airbnb was like, to really engage him and get really the same answers, but in a way that could engage him. Um, and so you can imagine the culture is important for us to understand of even how we go through this process. Uh, competition, obvious, I guess. Who's out there? Who's doing the same thing? Um, I think what a lot of people don't think about here is it's not just about looking uh, at your core competitors. So, you know, Premier League, there's no point just looking at other leagues. Um, we have to have a good understanding of where they sit alongside them, but they wanted to change their business completely. You know, they wanted to change um, the way that US sports were kind of doing things. They were building brands that actually people associated with, like the NBA. People wear NBA branded clothes, which is the kind of competition, not just their team. So how do we kind of look outside of their kind of core competitors and see what other people are doing? And there's lots of times we'll also look at, um, so we looked at a lot of technology brands in the Premier League as well. We said that actually you're moving into a space now where you're not just a sports brand. You're actually fighting for people's attention through entertainment. You are an entertainment. So actually the likes of Spotify, the likes of Netflix, these are all kind of moving into your space. So what are those guys doing? They're your competitors as well. So how do we kind of learn from what they're doing and how people are interacting with those brands as well? So we have to look inside and outside of their kind of core competition. 
the context, I think, of course, what's happening in the world, what are the changes that are happening, what's happening in the business, politically, what's happening, I guess we just look across what could impact this. If we're going to go out with a certain message, what's happening in the world um, that, that might impact it or, or make people not believe in it or will have issues with it, et cetera, going forward. And this is really important when we're working with a lot of the brands that are truly global brands. We need to understand you know, what the context is of what they're going into. And of course, I mean, the most important, like the customers. So this is about understanding, you know, it's, it's great for us to talk to people who've had incredible experiences. You can, you know, that's what someone like Airbnb is about. This person had the most delightful time. They've, they've written about it. They've blogged about it. They're the biggest advocate of it. But actually, we really want to talk to the ones that have had terrible experiences as well. You know, learn why is it terrible? What's the difference between those two things? And, and, and what is it that, that makes that difference? Um, and that's why talking to people is vital in customer service, because these are the people that are really dealing with those calls. Uh, and we need to kind of like learn from them, learn what we need to change going forward. OK, so that's what we're trying to do with um, when we're going to go going through all of these things. And we're interviewing people. We're running workshops. We're, we, have, we have hours and hours of audio from, oh, sorry. Um, through, um, I guess water, what are you are asking a question? Can you go back to the slides with the, like, from hierarchy, where you had to design. Um, yeah. How, how did you, was there any bottleneck? Um, you, you come in doing a kind of design project branding, and then you have a, a design officer there. How did you get the buy-in? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to just be the design. I think there's quite often bottlenecks. Um, and I think it's something I will touch on a little bit later of how important it, it is that people who who start this process are, are, are with it from the very beginning. That's how you get around it. Because the worst thing is, uh, and we've had this, you know, people quite often ask me, you know, what's the, what's the thing that ruins a project? What's the worst thing that can happen? And it quite often happens. This is why I put the investors on the board at the top. It's quite often a board member who will float in halfway through the project. You've done all of this research. You have all of these facts. Then you start articulating it into the touch points that they need. But he joins then with his opinion which is nothing more than opinion. You know, it's no, it's, there's no reason to why it's there, but he's a big voice in the room. That can destroy what you're doing. You know, it has to be a full process to go through it. So the way that we kind of avoid any bottleneck is to really, that's why we go as wide as possible. We want to make sure that everybody's involved, everybody feels like they've been listened to, everybody's had their chance to share their kind of thoughts on it. And then I'll show you also later how we keep them involved. It's vitally important. You know, it can't just be something that we start at the beginning with a couple of people, disappear for three months, come back and tell a company and everyone that works for it, now this is what you stand for. We have to take them on the journey with us. So it's not just the chief design officers and those C-suite people that can be bottlenecks, you know. Huge teams of product designers, of, um, you know, even the HR teams, they can, they can be the people that can, that can ruin it if they haven't been taken on the process. So I'll show you some of that, uh, of how we do it. Where did I get to? Okay, yeah, here's an example I thought I'd show you. So yeah, we have all of these interviews, all of these things. This is how it's very different to uh, the standard ones we've done with maybe a more corporate client. But you can see what we try to do is like be in their space. We try and, we try and live with them pretty much as much as we can. So we move our teams over, we sit in their offices, we, we do all of the workshops, all of the interviews, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the kind of like real gems and nuggets of kind of information also comes from just walking the halls, bumping into people, having conversations. There's some incredible moments and some incredible kind of real revelations about Airbnb that came from their in-house kind of kitchen team at Airbnb. But you know, you need to kind of talk to everybody in the process. And go back to that point, we really want everyone to feel like they've had their chance to kind of be part of this project as well. Um, and this is another thing that will kill the project, the alignment. So we will hear a lot of things. You know, what will come out of this will be, we're, we, we're definitely for this, and we're definitely against this. And we, we can't have any of those real tensions of like what we stand for. We can't stand for these two things. We've got to, we've got to be crystal clear and make a decision as a whole team, as a whole company, that these are the core things that we really believe in and are right. And this doesn't just happen between like certain uh, parts of the business. We've had this between founders. Um, and it's, it turns into therapy. It's like we've literally got a room with two people divided who for the first time have heard that they've built a business for very different reasons. Um, and so we have to kind of like have those tensions in the room and discuss them and kind of like figure out where do we sit and get some agreement on it. If we try and ignore it, and if we try and go forward and just ignore it, it will definitely come back and destroy it. So we have to figure those things out. I know you've had uh, Johannes from Get Your Guide in here. Um, and you know, we had great workshops with him where, again, in that workshop, which was, which was held in Berlin, 
certain tensions came out again, I think, between the founders and we have to kind of get alignment. You know, we have to discuss them. But it's a standard thing that kind of happens. But it's something that's absolutely critical to the project. It will fail completely if we don't do that. But what else do we do? I think the other thing that a lot of companies don't do is it's very easy for us to sit in very nice offices in San Francisco uh, or London um, in our ivory towers and kind of say, oh, that's it, We've, we really understand the experience of these things now. We have to kind of do everything and we have to learn everything. So with someone like Deliveroo, are you aware of Deliveroo with these guys? Yeah, you know, it means that their core product is delivering food. So it means that we have to get on our bikes. We have to trawl around London. We have to pick up food from the restaurants. We have to meet the owners of the restaurants. And we have to understand what the pain points are of like doing this, what's great about doing this, what the customers love about the service, what's different about delivery. So we have to, we have to really get uh, under the skin of a business and learn absolutely everything. I think what was great actually when I don't know if you've seen what we did for delivery, but you know, they were in a real race against uh, Uber Eats who were coming into the marketplace. Obviously a huge business backing them up and, and delivery were looking to, to grow massively, but knew that this was on the horizon. And, and a core finding from here really was like how valuable the, the drivers were to the business. Now how of course that was gonna be a core thing to their growth. They needed to dominate the market. They needed to have the riders to create that kind of micro delivery. So really what we did was the core focus of the delivery rebrand was actually on the riders themselves, was on creating, creating this amazing like uniform which has changed since here, um, which we again, we worked with someone like Nike to kind of make sure it was like, had this reflective material that made them the safest on the road. We worked with a road safety expert to make sure that um, you know, the, the delivery riders were gonna be much safer than Uber Eats drivers. Just because we wanted to kind of show them that you, we really care about the riders. You're not just part of our kind of company, it's actually we care about you more than the rest. And that was actually something that was fundamentally changed through the process to make sure that we could have that growth. It became a, a real focus. And of course, we did the same with Airbnb. Um, people always think this is really glamorous that we got to kind of fly around the world and stay in Airbnbs, but um, we had to do it in a week. So it meant somebody flying to Sydney for one night and then uh, I think they went back to Japan for one night and then they came back to the UK. And we just had four people trekking around all these places, huge cities, like tiny tier three kind of cities, and then also like villages to understand the, the huge differences between staying in these locations with Airbnb. And it wasn't as glamorous as it sounds. Um, but of course, you know, going to the local offices, again, taking everyone on the journey, it's, it's easy to forget that you're not just in HQ, you're not just in San Francisco, it's a global business. So how do we make sure that the people in all those local offices also have kind of had their kind of say to say, well, actually, this is what it's about here and this is what it means and this is why I joined. So we, we kind of try and do a lot to get under the, under the skin of, of what a business is. And I think really this is what we're, we're hoping for. Uh, this is what Mr. Chesky said to me at the very end of it. He's like, in a couple of weeks, you guys became part of our team. You became Airbnb. And, and I kind of always hold that up there as I like, actually, that's the ultimate goal is that you shouldn't really be able to tell the difference between your team and our team by the end. It should feel like we're all Airbnb, we're all working together to get this. Uh, and we have done that. We've become the experts. So I think that's, that's vital to the success. Uh, and I think, again, what makes it fail is um, if we're not allowed in if we are kind of kept at arm's length, it's very hard to kind of really understand what the truths behind the brand are. Okay. So then what? You, we, you know, we, we, have, we have got then absolutely tons and tons of information, overwhelming amounts of information. And we generally then do step away from, from our clients' offices because it's sometimes very easy to get wrapped up in, in the Kool-Aid of those businesses and, and start believing absolutely everything is true without that kind of critical distance. So we come back with um, loads of information and start sifting through it to find some kind of commonalities, to find these truths, and it has to be a truth. There's so many ways of interacting with modern brands now that if you start saying that you're actually this and then people start interacting with you, seeing your social media channels, they're all saying something slightly different, you instantly kind of do not believe that brand. So every single thing that they do has to point to it. So therefore it has to be a truth. It has to be something that the business really believes. Ah, oh, yes. Here's my visual of lots of information. Um, so then um, this is what we do. We start finding kind of clusters of things like this is really interesting. This is said again and again and again. This is something that we're really picking up on. This is something that lots of people have talked about. This feels de very different. This feels like it really resonates with those customers. This, this works in the context. And, and, and we start finding these things um, 
and start realizing well, what do they mean or how do we kind of put these together into potentially being our, our meaningful difference. So this is where I'll use MV as, as an example of how we did it. It's quite a simple, a simple one to explain. So we found three things really. Um, I think we found more, but there were three things that kind of really elevated to the service and were said again and again and again. And when we were especially looking at them in comparison to people like Home Away or, or any of the other kind of hotel groups, um, there were some, there were, there were things that really stood out that made that experience different. And I think when you think about the best experience that you could have, you know, it's all about people. Um, I guess a lot of you have stayed on Airbnb. Yeah. You will have had mixed experiences. But actually, if you've had one of the best experiences, it's usually when it's somebody whose real house it is that you're staying in. And uh, they've welcomed you at the door. They've, they've greeted you with the keys. And there's a real pride, actually, about where they live and, and then welcoming you, welcoming you into their house. And that's something very different to meeting a concierge or somebody at a hotel. There's a very different warmth to that. Um, and these people are really true and authentic. And actually, they, um, they help you do something else. They help you kind of navigate places differently. And we, we realized that this places was, was something else that Airbnb stood for that was very different to another experience. You started to, to navigate places through what those people recommended to you. So instead of being pointed to a terrible restaurant that the hotel is going to point you to because they probably get kickbacks from it, you actually start going to somewhere that someone who lives there recommends and loves. Maybe they go there with their wife every kind of weekend. It's their favorite restaurant. Or maybe there's something, um, something on, like a private view all the time in London. Maybe I would say, actually, it's only on this week, but while you're here, you should definitely do it. And these are the things you always hope you're going to find when you're kind of traveling. But before, you never really did, because you always end up doing the same things, like the West End or the London Eye in London, um, which I would never recommend you do. So you started, you started kind of like navigating places completely differently. And the final one, now, I was hugely cynical about this. I think it's because it's a British thing to be cynical about this. But um, it did come up again and again. And I think it was this idea of love it was a, or, or building on this idea of community. Um, people really attached themselves to this product and feeling like it represented them, feeling like it empowered them, feeling like actually, you know, they were, they were these micro entrepreneurs that were running their own business. And really, Airbnb wasn't this corporate machine, but it was something that they loved identifying with. And they loved the, the, the people that stayed at their homes they could keep in contact with. And there was a real warmth around this product. There wasn't around a lot of technology companies in this space. And of course, you, you know, we put those three things together and it wasn't this simple. But you know, we had lots of things on the wall of like, how, what does this mean? And, and of course, you know that we got to this idea that actually these three things mean that you're traveling completely differently for the first time. And we're not just finding you places to stay. We're not just finding you unique places or cool spaces. We're actually helping you travel the world and feel like for the first time, you don't have to be a tourist. You can feel like you can belong absolutely anywhere in the world. And this really kind of aligned with not just what the company was doing today, but what the company also wants to do in the future, which is really important when we're talking about brand. You know, it can't just be something that resonates now. It's got to kind of live with the company for the next 10, 20 years. Um, so that became their meaningful difference. And so you'll notice that we haven't started making logos. We haven't started um, changing photography or coming up with color palettes. We've, we've spent the whole time really figuring out first, what is this platform that we're going to build absolutely everything off? Um, you know, I, I said that they did build this tagline from it, but really that wasn't where we started. That was just something that, again, was their way of articulating this idea of building a world where you belong anywhere. They wanted to do it with their marketing. But I don't really need to show you all the sketches and everything of where we got to because it's been out in the world for years. But you'll see that the mark itself was something that we created that actually had the values, uh, those values actually built into it. You know, it had the location mark in the middle because we wanted it to kind of represent, you know, finding those incredible places. There is, of course, the A from the Airbnb, but there was also this idea of warmth and love. So we, we built the love heart into that. And this isn't something we do with every company, but it was really important for Airbnb again, because through the research, through the research, we found that actually it was very hard in some of those emerging markets for people to understand the word Airbnb. You know, the letters even in English don't make sense next to each other. It's only because you've heard it said a number of times that you, you can say it. Uh, and they were really worried about this in, in some of their emerging markets, especially in China, where they really wanted to focus. So they asked us if um, we could do a bit of research project into changing the name, which is crazy now when you think about it. But um, you know, at the time, Brian was really sat on it. He was like, I think we need to change the name. We don't supply bed and breakfast anymore. Um, it's not about airbeds anymore, so it doesn't even back up. We need to change it. But there was so much equity already 
in some of those established markets behind that name that we kind of looked into, well, how do we solve it in a different way? And we said, well, actually, if we could build a symbol that represents this idea of belonging, it's something that can be shared throughout the world, and it's something that actually when people identify it, they'll realize that this is Airbnb, this is somewhere I can belong. This is something that I, I understand this clearly as a Wi-Fi symbol. It doesn't matter where I am in the world, I recognize what this is. And so we really want to build a lot of, of equity into this. We want to transcend language and not worry about it. Um, there was also something through the research that came out, which was a really beautiful story about, um, has anyone heard of the hobo code? Strange code. So this is, again, more of a San Franciscan thing. But uh, basically, homeless people in the US would, would have their own language, and they'd leave little symbols and signs to let you know, uh, and other homeless people know, if this is a safe place to stay or actually if this is a terrible place to stay. And they were like letting people know about food and, and kind of like shelter and how long they could stay there for through this kind of language of leading the, these symbols. And we really love the idea of building that into what Airbnb is doing, a symbol for that community that's kind of within its, that it, that's within the community to kind of recognize. <coughs> Excuse me. But then you can see how absolutely everything we created then changed. So of course now our tone of voice changes from being about places to stay um, and, and listings to actually, you know, really articulating and talking about belonging. Um, photography, which used to be just very cold, empty shots of listings. Now, actually, if you look at the brand of photography in Airbnb, it's, it's not really the listings at all. It's actually about people having those incredible experiences together, finding these things and feeling like they're part of the community rather than being a complete tourist. Um, so the product, which has changed now, but when it started, you know, this was a real core component of it. Um, the reason we wanted that, that kind of moving image at the top was to show people sharing that symbol, show people kind of identifying places where you can belong, to show you finding these kind of local bakeries that you just don't through other platforms. And, and it was such a brave decision for them to change the kind of the, the, the core line to just welcome home from find a place to stay. You know, Airbnb wasn't, it's hard to think back to them, but it wasn't hugely established. Not everybody understood it didn't understand what the product exactly was, but we just put this line in as a bit of a kind of like on, on our visuals, saying it'd be perfect if you went for this. But how brave they were, they actually just said, that's it, we're gonna run with Welcome Home on our kind of core, on our core homepage of the product, um, which really summed up what Airbnb was compared to the rest. Technical changes that they made, so um, even then looking at, well, how does the product adapt so that even when you visit it more, the product even feels like you belong there, you feel like you're at home there. So the more that you logged in, actually it now started curating and tailoring the kind of experience to you, which is, which is a much more product focused thing, but something that again helped back up that core purpose. Um, They'd never talked about brand or what they stood for before. Um, and it wasn't something that we advised them to do, but this is a film I'll show you later, um, which was something that we did for the employees, which they wanted to elevate. They now wanted to talk about why they were different and what they stood for, because they were proud about it, and they were proud that it made them completely different. Uh, and then another tool that we created uh, was the ability to, this was a re really awkward meeting, actually, in the, uh, <laughs> in the process, where, uh, it was with Brian Chesky himself, and I think we just started going through, I think it was when we were first introducing like the core concepts and the logos, and he, I just described it as, an, and then the core company logo, and he said, this is not a company. And this, he actually went a bit crazy, stood up and said, this is a community. I still rent my space out on Airbnb. I'm not, I know I'm a founder of this business, but I'm still part of this community, and this is a community. And I don't want a business that is just represented by a cold logo which was tricky to bake into to the process. But how we adapted that was then that we created a symbol that was really simple to draw, that everyone could kind of change it and identify with it. So if you want to put your home on Airbnb, of course you can have an Airbnb mark, but it can be uniquely yours. And the only guideline around making one of these symbols is that once you've made one, you can never copy it again. It's unique and it can only be used by that one person. So they built a tool uh, for their launch where actually you could go on Airbnb as a host, you could share a story about your listing or where you lived and actually it would pull out parts of that, of that data and start creating you a mark based off some of those things. And then you could tweak it as well. And then you could actually create uh, things for your listing, like you could create mugs, you could create stickers for, for your kind of like shower gels and things that you put in the shower. So that actually it really empowered those micro entrepreneurs to feel like a business, but not feel like I'm Airbnb, but feel like I, I'm myself. And there's something else that we did, and this came from really just doing all that research and meeting the people that were some of the core Airbnb community. Um, Airbnb really wanted on their website still a how it works section. And so it's still there today. If you go right up to the top, you can click it very functionally. It will tell you how Airbnb works. But you know, through the process, we met so many people who had not just used the product and had a great experience on it, but actually changed their lives through the products. And so one guy that I met 
uh, in New York. He worked for the post office out there and he was telling me the story that he'd worked for the post office for about 20 years and absolutely hated his job, but realized that actually by just renting out one room in his Airbnb apartment in New York, um, he was able to kind of earn the same money as he was doing in the post office. So he quit. And then all he does now is he showed me, he just has this blog where he goes to watch uh, live music. He takes photographs of it and he posts them on his blog. And this blog had over like a million users then, so I don't know how, it has, how many it has now. But for me, that's a really powerful how it can work section compared to the functional house with this many bedrooms, this is how much it's valued at. So we pulled out some of those stories and we put them on the website where people could share them. And I think actually they also built another platform completely called Belong Anywhere, um, which just housed hundreds of stories from, from their community. Other things that changed, which I like talking about, because uh, I think people always think it's the huge big ticket items, like the website, of course, that's going to change. All the marketing communications, of course, it's going to change the HR, et cetera, et cetera. But meaningful difference means that every single decision should be thought about. Well, how does it build on this idea of belonging? How does it help us kind of like convey what Airbnb is all about? And these are just the colors. And of course, there's nothing special about naming colors. Lots of brands have done it. But what's great about this is these are all the, the, the kind of like streets in those core territories, all those offices that we went around and met. Actually, these were their most popular Airbnb streets or areas in those kind of cities. So it felt like actually, you know, we're already showing where people are kind of belonging already with identifying their colors. But the top one, Roush, is quite a strange word. Does anyone know about Roush? So if you look into the founding story of Airbnb, Roush Street is where the first ever Airbnb listing was. That's where Brian and Joe met. That's where they kind of stayed in their listing, made the first ever airbed on the, on the floor, served breakfast so they could pay their rent. And so what's great about that is, you know, it, it might only happen a few times, but if anyone in the business when they join asks, why it's Roush, someone organically has to tell them the founding story of Airbnb, which is a great way of thinking, how can every small item just work that little bit harder? Does it? That's funny. So they live, I bet they don't know that. Because Brian still has, that's still where he lives. I bet he has no idea that means be drunk. I'm going to tell him. That's fantastic. Um, I bet he has been drunk there a few times. Um, but this is, this is the tool. So the tool as well, you know, this is really important to Brian from day one. In fact, when we launched the brand, he made us kind of monitor how many people were creating and sharing the symbol. And I'll go into later the bad versions of it. But um, of course, there were, there were millions of versions of the, of the kind of symbol that were being created. And this was really important to, to what Brian wanted to do. He wanted to see people creating these, sharing them, that everyone was drawing it. Um, and this was actually the first project where my mother fully understood what I'd done uh, as a job, because even she saw it. So I've seen that thing you did with Airbnb, because uh, people were already sharing it. So it was just showing you that's the ultimate kind of like metric for me. Um, but then the marketing, as I say, that completely changed. So instead of doing campaigns now, like everyone else, they were doing uh, one less stranger campaigns. They were also doing, uh, you know, these where they were still talking very much about the product. These came about a year afterwards. But again, they kind of changed the messaging from live there, even if it's just for one night, which just again summed up their kind of their, their purpose and their difference compared to the rest. So you can see, and if you, if you keep an eye out now for Airbnb's messaging, you'll see how it all points back to that. It's changed very much from the beginning. Um, but these are things that happened since, you know, after the project finished, you know, we weren't involved with these, but this is how important making sure that you understand not just what the brand is doing today, but what it's going to do in the future uh, is to kind of building a solid proposition because, you know, Airbnb, you've probably seen now have experiences. I've seen now, I think they're even launching restaurants, but they all completely fit just as the, the, the kind of fuel band did with Nike, it completely fits for them together. Because of course, when I go to a city now, what do I want to do there? How do I learn about the city? How do I engage in the culture even more? It all backs up that idea of belonging as well. So it's really important that we didn't build a proposition for our business that wasn't going to sit with where they were going in the future. And then just to build on the, the point I made earlier about it has to be a truth. You know, we, we can interact with the brand, we can interact with founders so much now that if, if Brian Chesky, um, yeah, so actually, you know, this is, uh, this is Brian Chesky's uh, personal Twitter account. And this is what I think people don't understand when they're thinking it'd be really nice to stand for this one thing. And then they go out and tweet something completely different. If this tweet was um, some Trump supporting wall building tweet, um, it'd be very hard to kind of understand or believe that Airbnb was built as a business that allowed people to, to belong anywhere. You know, he has to have this political stance. And, and this is his idea was about, you know, re the refugees, if, if we, we want to kind of help them, we want to kind of find places for them. And then let's check if this works. Yes. Um, 
their CSR, you know, what they're investing in, where they kind of like actually help, even on the charitable kind of side of things as well, is, is doing that. It's helping people to kind of displace through disasters or like how do people kind of use their space for good. Um, and this is something that I've been talking to, to Joe Gebbio about recently. I think they're looking at, he's looking at heading up this complete arm of the business where this is just his, his kind of primary focus is figuring out how do people use their homes to help people who've been displaced or kind of moved through, through wars, through disasters, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of the final state. Any questions on that? Okay. Sort of the final stage now is then, well, how do we, how do we launch it to the world? Like, what do we need to do? We've, we've, we've created this incredible kind of purpose that sets us apart from everybody else. And, and how do we implement it? Well, of course, uh, as I mentioned, it, it has to change all of those things. They're very kind of tactical things, you know, the tone of voice, the photography, the product, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things do need to change. Um, or we need to kind of look at how they're not aligning with, with what our purpose is. Um, but it's not just those, you know, the whole business strategy changes. You know, I, I, you have to look at certain things that may be on the table before. If this is what we really stand for and we've agreed as a business that fundamentally this, we're all aligned on this, potentially some things that we're thinking about doing in the future might not sit within that, um, that kind of proposition anymore. And so it has to kind of challenge you on making the right decisions about where you go in the future as well. Employees, you know, how do we how do we build the right culture or maintain a culture of people who who believe in this in this purpose? So we have to work closely with people like in HR to make sure that they're, that they're building this into even how they interview people. The content we're creating, the marketing we're doing, the culture, all of these things now need to kind of go through this this lens. And that's going back to it, why it's so important that that person's been invested from the very beginning, because, you know, to make the whole business change, it has to come from this, this one person who's leading the business. He has to stand in front of everybody and say, this is what we believe, this is what we stand for, and now we need to align our business to it. So it can't come from anywhere else. It has to come from the person It's a CE's role to drive that. Secondly, oh, sorry, yeah. So do you generally get hired also by the CEO? Different. So a bit of both, a bit of both. I'd say, so if you think about the Airbnb one, which is the one we're really focusing on, both of those uh, founders came through Rhode Island School of Design. They fully understood the value of brand. I have to admit they were still very much on the logo tagline kind of understanding of it, but they did understand the impact of it. And they really wanted to be involved. Now, other businesses like the Premier League, very different. You know, we do get brought in as like, this is the marketing exercise. So we have to kind of educate them through the process. And it really is going through almost like presentations like this with them to show them how it will impact absolutely everything. And there's a bit of a question mark for us as well. That's why that ambition uh, line that I put at the beginning isn't just something that um, I think, you know, we want our clients to have in terms of like what they're doing with their business. It's something that we have to see as well, that it's gotta be something that they're willing to change. They're willing to kind of bring everybody in. And if they're not, sometimes it's a painful decision, but we have to step away from doing the projects. We know it'll just fail. Uh, sorry. How long does such a process take with all the involved people? I mean, this is some form of massive research that you buy initially. Yeah. Um, this is another classic client question. Um, so, Airbnb was an incredibly quick project. Because, because really frustrating, they told us. They, I think they came to us in the, they pitched in the August, and they went to kick off in the September. Yeah, and they wanted it launched for Christmas. So, um, which is why we had one night in Sydney, <laughs> one night in China. Um, we had multiple teams working and overlapping as much as we could to kind of do it. Now, what was really frustrating about our project is then they didn't launch Christmas. The guidelines were finished, the, the kind of like, the, I guess the, the more clear and obvious deliverables were finished for then, but the product and everything, their teams did not manage to change that by that time. So they actually didn't launch, I think, until the June the following year. Yeah, frustrating. Um, but it, uh, quite often, I think, Three months is really, a, 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 it depends on the size of the business. It's fairly quick to do it in three months, but if it's a small business, you know, having to kind of talk to that many people, someone really like Airbnb side should be six months at least to a, to a year, I'd say. But um, yeah, it completely depends. Yeah. How long did it take with the Premier League or the Champions League? I mean, there's a very established friends. Uh, yeah. There are many egos in the room, obviously. Well, many egos in many rooms. So did it take much longer? Were there more? I, I would assume that they're not as open as Airbnb because obviously they had many steps to do. Um, so I've got to be careful here, haven't I? Because I know this is going to be broadcast the world. But they were, um, 
they were very different to Airbnb. So they were a lot less brand savvy. So I um, don't know how much you know about the Premier League's kind of structure, but they used to be the Barclays Premier League. Do you remember? And so really the Premier League weren't doing any marketing, weren't doing any kind of brand. It was really just to organize the fixtures, to organize the kind of, um, I guess, the, the, the rights for the television. Um, and Barclays did absolutely everything else. And, and that's how it's been since, since the start. So before that, it was Carling. It was kind of all these kind of very cliched, manly uh, brands that they used to associate with. So this is the first time that they were realizing, actually, now we have the power to kind of do this ourselves. So um, when we kind of went into them, they only had one person in their marketing team. And they just wanted it rolled out for the season that was about to kick off. I mean, the touch points alone was incredible. So there was a huge education piece with them that we had to go through to kind of like let them know how the brand would impact the business. Um, so again, it was like taking them through kind of like the credentials like this. We were interviewing lots of people throughout the business. Then we presented back and played back what was going to need to change and how it needed to change. And we showed them all the negative press that was around them and what they were now going to start to start articulating to kind of change those behaviors. Um, and it really was an education, but there was a great moment actually with the Premier League, which was just that I remember the, the MD, Richard Masters, just really kind of like really understanding what we were saying. And it was like a, it was just like a light bulb moment in a meeting where he kind of said, I understand. It's like, of course, we can't just do this by like how we've always done it, which is just fire out stats about how much money we're putting into X, Y, and Z. We need to tell the stories. We need to kind of build that kind of emotional side of the brand so people understand what it is that we do. So that's a good example of um, how we kind of educated them. But that, that did take a good two or three weeks at the beginning of the process really to get them up to speed but it's usually presenting people back with the facts of their own business and listening to people within their business asking for these things rather than just us dictating to them what they need to do <coughs> yeah which did you do first the premier league or the champions league oh and did any well you've got to win the premier league to get into the champions league <laughs> And that is how it happened. So you can tell I've cracked that joke before. Um, so yeah, we did the Premier League first. And uh, I just sent an email to the Champions League after we'd finished that. Which is one of those kind of like incredible new business stories. And they were like, well, strangely, we are looking at our next cycle. But we've, they, they said, we've already finished it. But we'd love to hear what you're doing with the Premier League anyway. So I'm, I'm always a big fan of just jumping on a plane and flying over like I have now. Just jump over and see people face to face. And then we presented them our kind of like what we'd done. And I think it was the same thing. They really understand like a bigger value of what we'd done. It just wasn't just beautiful graphics, logos, and how it changed the tone of voice. It was they saw how they were shifting and how it opened up commercial opportunities and et cetera for, for the Premier League, how it um, changed their CSR and how their website was now talking and building a lot more kind of positive sentiment than previously. And I think actually they then said, well, we'll invite you to pitch. You're coming in late, but can you pitch on the Champions League? And then we won that. OK, so your portfolio does, does speak. Uh, well, well yeah. it does now. Yeah, now. But I guess you know when we did this, <laughs> we had a couple of small jobs. These were, this is always what we wanted to do, but up until that point, I think what always happened was uh, we'd get really far in the process. We'd be the most exciting. We'd do incredible things like build that listing and the clients would come in and they'd be like, oh, this is incredible. We love it, we love it. And then it'd always be the question mark of, but the other agency has 20 years of doing it. And we just couldn't kind of get over that hurdle. And it really took someone, I think, like Airbnb, who just didn't care. You know, I think they realized that they didn't have 20 years of doing it. So why should we worry about these guys? They're the right fit. And as soon as we had that one proof point, actually, of course, then it gave the confidence to a lot of the other businesses that were coming to see us to, to go with us. Okay. Uh, and so going way back to maybe your first branding project, um, when you had no previous portfolio yeah. to, how would you, I mean, people would sometimes have to start from ground zero or well, we started so um so we actually started the first job that came in um was a job for for nokia uh, which wasn't a branding job it was as a tiny kind of production job and um it's funny because I, I just did a kind of uh, interview for the blog and they asked me, you know, what's it like starting a business? I said, we didn't really have a business plan. We just had this belief that like, we need to do this. We can't find it out there and we'll do it. And, but we didn't start with any finance. We didn't have any funding in the bank. You know, the first thing I remember doing was turning up because we'd, we'd rented desk space. But I didn't realize that literally meant desk space. There were no chairs. So we spent the first day going out and looking for chairs. Um, but, you know, what came in was this one email from a connection that we had somewhere from Nokia that said, like someone's let me down in the artwork department. Could you just put our logo next to this other logo and send it back to me as a kind of like a illustrator file? 
that was our first job. But I think, you know, what I realized from that is like, yeah, we did it. And, and we sent it back and, and then something else came. It was equally as small until eventually, you know, we, we, we always did it happily. We were always positive about it. We always kind of like never burn any bridges, never kind of turn things down because it's just like, ugh, it's below us, it's beneath us. You know, we understood that we did that. We could, we could, build, we could build a sort of relationship with them. And um, eventually we just got one, short, one chance. I think, you know, they've got strict procurement and so they have to bring three agencies in to pitch on everything. And they had two really. And then they said, well, do you want to fill in the last space? But we won it. We won the job with them, which is only a small job. And from there, it escalated. And we turned, when you think back to those days, I mean, it was, a lot of it was production work that wasn't right. But we turned Nokia from that 300,000 euro job into a 6 million euro account in four years. Now, it wasn't the business that we wanted. But what that allowed us to do was scale. So, you know, it was a lot more production heavy than we wanted it to be. But you can't be naive to think that you're going to go into a meeting with someone like Airbnb and they're going to see three people sitting there and think you can, you can deliver the business for them. You know, they need a business of a certain scale. So what it did was we, we grew our business through that investment of not quite the right work. And then we're pitching for things that we knew were what we wanted the business to be, but we had the scale and we had the team that we had to do it and we had the finances to kind of do it, et cetera, et cetera. And then really as the Airbnb happened, it was that proof point, we just gradually transitioned the business. I mean, we could also see that Nokia were not going to be around for much longer, so we had to do it pretty quickly. But that was, um, that was really how the business kind of grew and changed. One last question, maybe, before. Um, are there projects you say no to currently? Like yeah. Any niche? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, the, and for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think a lot of people have. They're kind of like, well, why are you going to do something? I mean, we, we try and create a good balance of the projects for the team. You know, I need to keep a, I need to keep a really good balanced team of kind of big brand thinking people, but also small kind of boutique agency type people. And I, and I need to kind of get that good balance of jobs. So a lot of the time we'll look at, well, actually, you know, this may not be the most profitable job, but actually it's going to be fantastic for the team or it's going to build a really brilliant profile for us. So it's worth the investment. You know, it's something we really believe in. Um, <laughs> but then the things that we'll say no to, I think one is that if we don't, if we can definitely sense that they don't have the ambition to do this, it's literally just a marketing exercise. They just want us to kind of like put the, you heard the phrase lipstick on a pig, just kind of make it look fantastic and not really change anything behind it. And I think we realize eventually that will fail and we'll get the blame for it. So we do say no to things like that as well. And ethically, if they don't, if we don't believe in ethically, we've had a few kind of like North or South Korean arms dealers or something that have wanted to rebrand and I don't really want to get involved. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, I understand that the branding of the, you need a certain timing for a brand like you build to really be applied to a business. So I don't imagine Airbnb the first year when they started to have the same kind of messaging and to have the same kind of brand proposition that you yeah. uh, that you shifted to now um, because they probably always a certain timing for the business that needs a certain branding and then it evolves and it changes as the business grows or not. Mm. Um, what would you recommend to a starting business, so to a startup, maybe even like yourself, when you when you were starting, did you have a proposition that was as clear as it is today, no. that you're pitching it today, probably no. not? Uh, and it's really hard. You're right. It's hard to have that. And I think this is something I've talked a lot about and, and looked at as a business because also, you know, there's a certain size or scale of job that we, we kind of certainly need to work with. It's, we can't invest in every job, but some really interesting startups. Plus, I don't think some startups need everything that we delivered for the likes of Airbnb. I mean, you, you can't invest the, the amount of money in brand at the beginning when you're starting out. So it's like, how do we kind of like create those levels. I think you still need to have a, a kind of wider kind of understanding of what you're starting to do. And, and I always say it's like if you've invested and put your time into a business plan, brand is really like the kind of more emotional, softer articulation of that. It's like this is what we're going to do as a business and here's all the kind of like the finance that backed it up and what we're going to do. And then the brand is really and here's how we communicate it to people and employees of why they're going to join and why you should use our product. So I think I'm trying to figure this out at the current moment. Like how do we work with founders just to really give them those kind of building blocks to start in the right direction and then really year two three down the line when it's grown and it's got, it's got some traction to revisit it and build upon that and kind of refine it a little bit more um, but I haven't figured that out yet because it, it is difficult um, you know you can't afford it at the beginning but it'd be perfect to start with belong anywhere on day one of course yeah. or, or like building a meaningful or doing a meaningful change like yeah for most beloved brands um, but do you have like any any sort of like assets that young founders have to need to have or or that you would recommend them to have to really set up a base for the later 
Mm. No. Like, do, do I have to do any emission but, statement? Or? No, but that's, that's exactly, that's really interesting. It's something that we're talking about is exactly, how do we build? And I think this is what you're asking for is almost like the conversation we're having with, with my internal teams. Like, how do we build a kit that's like, you know, we can give to people that's like, this is what we can do. We can run it really quickly. We're talking like a few weeks just to give you the kind of like, the, the rails to kind of go in the right direction and hopefully build a good relationship for you to come back. And usually that then turns into, well, are you gonna start taking equity to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, it's, it's fine, but I kind of see myself as like, I wanna build a brand business, not a kind of venture capital business. So how do I just kind of like work with people and hope that we build that good relationship they want to come back to us? But yeah, well, you should keep in touch because we're gonna be looking absolutely at that because I think it's great. And I think I get asked about it more and more uh, from startups. Okay, how are we doing for time? been ages. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go through these last things fairly quickly. So, of course, you've got to launch this to, to the world. Um, this is a nerve-wracking time, especially when you're working with the big, big, kind of very emotionally connected to their audience brands like Airbnb, like the Premier League, like the Champions League. So we've got to kind of understand what we do with that. Um, but it's really easy to forget that you shouldn't launch it externally uh, until you've launched it internally. Um, and, and there's a reason that we do that, and I think a lot of you touched on it earlier on, is like, how do we get buy-in? How do we get people to kind of like want to, to understand what they need to do to change it? Well, it's only by kind of like making them feel really important in the process. So it's something like um, Deliveroo, for example, you know, even before we launch it, where we're, I'm not sure this is playing, we're documenting the entire, nope. Forget it. Um, yeah, so that was like a website really where we're just documenting the entire process. So we're even putting things on there because not everyone can be involved. You know, you do have core stakeholders, but we're kind of showing photographs of what's happening on a daily basis. We're posing questions on there so people can kind of relax, uh, like kind of uh, interact with us and kind of answer those questions. And we can take them on the journey. And then something else that happened was when uh, Airbnb launched. And it terrified me at the time is that two weeks before it launched to the public, Airbnb flew every single employee over to San Francisco and they hosted an entire day where they, they workshopped uh, around the idea of what belong anywhere meant. And um, they kind of talked about the founding story and where they'd come from. And then we created this film, which is what I showed you on the, the website uh, eventually. You know, this was built for the internal team just to introduce the brand to the employees. Now, the reason this terrified me is because obviously there's so many things that we sign up to, confidentiality, making sure this doesn't get out there in the real world, it's going through the trademark process, et cetera, et cetera. And I was sure that somebody in the audience was just gonna kind of like get the phone out, take a photo of it, and then it was gonna be out there. Um, but I think it was actually a really good uh, reflection of how empowered and how engaged those people felt that they were brought in, they were shown this before anyone else, they were told to keep it secret. And I think they really felt like, you know, I'm not a cog in a massive machine here that's just been told to answer this. I've been flown to San Francisco, I've been kind of given this whole day of why I work for this company and what this company stands for. And then um, I've been kind of shown what the tools are and what we're going to be talking to the world about in the future. And it was an incredible way of kind of the team really understanding the brand. And why do it? Because this is what we need to do. It's impossible for that CEO on his own just to keep standing up and banging people over the head with this is what we stand for. What we need to do is like figure out how do we build these and these evangelists that are just happy to kind of talk about the brand. And what I love about this is that, you know, these guys who work in the Apple store, they've probably never had any, a proper briefing, but you walk into an Apple store and those guys kind of feel the brand. They understand what it is to work at Apple. They understand how to act, how to communicate with people. And that's what you need to do. You need people to kind of really buy into it. So that even in the 100 years time, hopefully, when uh, you know, the founders move on, people still really understand what that brand means and, and, and there are people there talking about it. And that's what you're asking them to do. You're asking them really to deliver and execute the brand. Um, you can't just have a few people that were in the room, the major stakeholders doing everything. So you need them to do it. Now, the last thing you need to do is this where it gets very nerve wracking uh, is really believe and have a lot of faith in the process. You know, you've done all of this. You've done it for the right reasons. We've asked every single question there is. We've maybe validated it across the world. We've found kind of negative things, but we've kind of stood by why we're doing them. Because when it launches the world, you know, it's a difficult time. Um, I've kind of built this chart, which I show as this axis is love and this axis is time. And this is how I see every single brand launch, especially for big brands, go. It starts really positive. Like, and I mean instantly, this time is probably like 10 minutes. Um, 
because it goes out on all the design blogs who again we've probably invited along to those kind of briefings they've heard the entire story they know why we've done everything and they love it and they write these beautiful articles which are great saying how fantastic it is what it means the interviews the quotes etc and then the social media just wakes up and it instantly descends into, into hate. And uh, this, I mean, if, if you follow any design blogs, if you've looked at any launches of brands, this is what happens. And this is what happened with the Premier League. And, uh, and uh, I don't know why it's going back. Yeah, so Premier League, you know, we got, um, when we launched it, obviously we'd, we'd taken what was this whole lion and we'd removed it just to be the head of the lion. There's the whole lion. So lots of people compared us to kind of, I don't remember that story about the dentist who shot the lion in, uh, in Zimbabwe. So these things started popping up all over the internet. So someone here had said, I think it was the same week that David Bowie died that it came out. So all of these comments that just come out and you're just plagued with them. And you can see certain brands, if you don't, you have to build this into the process. You can see them getting nervous about what's going to happen and where they should stick with it. And Airbnb, you may, re you may remember this one. Now, this again, came out in the, um, this again came out when we were doing the validation. There was a lot of people saying, I can see a few sexual organs in that. Um, but, you know, it was right. It was, uh, uh, but all of this comes out, and it's very easy to get nervous. So there's this question comes out, I think, and it's like, what to do? So we need, we need to build this in because we know this is going to happen. Day one of the Premier League, we said to them, before we even start, you realize this is going to happen. Um, do you worry? Do we change it? Should we go back on what we do? Well, I think, I think I've got a good example of what happens there. If you change, if you at this point think, you know what will change, you're going to do what these guys did. And, you know, they launched this brand. They updated their identity. And I think the big problem here is they hadn't really done it for the right reasons. This really was just changing the logo. And I don't think they could really argue why they'd done it or what reasons they'd done it for. And they got a huge backlash. Because really, you know, people associate with this as something they grew up with. They reassociate with that brand. They changed it. Huge backlash. And then pfft, it didn't die, Gap. In fact, it's starting to come back now. But it just took years and years of like, what does this brand stand for? Like, no one really understands it. Completely lost its way. And I think there's a few examples of seeing brands that have done that. They've, they've, they've launched something. It's not really resonated with people. And then they change it. And then they kind of lose their way. It's kind of like telling people, like, we don't really know what it is that we do. So you've got to kind of, like, if you've done it for the right reasons, you've got to believe in that. And you've got to kind of push forward. So, you know, we knew that that Airbnb symbol was going to cause controversy. We knew that people had seen body parts in it. So with Airbnb, we actually set up a team that already, and they embraced it so brilliantly that they created an entire report on the logo itself, where they then had illustrators in-house making illustrations of every single thing that somebody saw within the Airbnb uh, mark itself. So it was a really positive way to deal with it. And of course, you know, that lasted what? A week maximum, it descends, it dies in the background. People then don't remember the first one. And of course, now people see the MV mark and, and it grows back into love. And this is a classic, I think, way of doing it. So a final point is like, what is those keys to creating the, the successful brand? I think it's firstly having a trust and respect. You've got to understand each other's role. I think it's about respect of not believing your experts at the beginning, but wanting to learn from them and understanding that everybody has a role in it. Um, you've got to build that strong relationship. So again, we can't just have people coming in and coming out. We need to like do this from the very beginning together. We need to like you know do this as a partnership, not as an agency and a brand. As I've just showed there, you've got to have belief in the process and belief in what you've done and why you've done it. Um, and and once you've made those decisions, you have to stand behind them and educate the world rather than just react to what the world does on day one. Um, investment from leadership, so it has to have the kind of CEO involved because it has to be presented back not just as our thing, but as uh, something that the CEOs and the founders really believe in. It needs time. You know, that from day one, it can't just launch and change opinions. We've got to keep delivering on this over and over again. You know, Airbnb, I don't think, really grew overnight to what it's to stand for, for a world where people can belong anyway. It's taken lots and lots of iterations of what that means to what they've been doing over time has to therefore be that complete truth behind it as well, or else people will find it out. And then it has to, of course, you have to have the ambition to make the changes that we've all agreed to. And I think, you know, I, I then look at, well, what are the metrics of success? And, and really, we get asked this all the time, and lots of people have different opinions of what they want to see. I think Airbnb, I, I just love looking at where their core competitor was when we joined them. They were like going toe to toe. People couldn't tell the difference between them. They were copying each other's marketing lines. And that's still what HomeAway do today. And it's a successful business. It's doing really well. But now I don't think even people see them in the same category. I think you know, they've, they've left them behind. And they stand for something so much bigger that they don't even feel like they're a similar product. Deliveroo you know, was all about um, their kind of revenues and their growth. And 
and what it did was just help them because they had the growth through the kind of riders. They were bringing in the riders much more than, than uh, Uber Eats could do. And even when people were joining Uber Eats, there were complaints because they were turning up in their delivery jackets and not their Uber Eats jacket. Uh, and then someone like Logitech, you know, this is a company that's really, for them, it was about their share price. You know, this was a company that's already IPO'd years and years ago. So how do we kind of like re-engage? How do we become much more relevant? But, you know, we can't track these, uh, these metrics here. You know, this, this is like three, four years ago, and they've really kind of turned it around. And, it, and I'm certainly not standing here claiming that this is all the brand's work because those businesses have had completely changed what they've been doing and how they've been doing it based on, on that piece of work. So I think, you know, some people ask me, is that the proof of a successful brand? And I think it really depends on the client and what their interpretation of it is. And I think if we go back to Airbnb, that was what Brian Chesky said that he wanted to be. He said, when I look at this brand, I suddenly realize everything I've been trying to say, but now I really have a way to express it. And I think really that's the success. It's like, I want to capture what makes those businesses amazing. What's their meaningful difference? And help people, them tell the world. And, and if they do that, I think it breeds a successful brand. Thank you. Questions? There's a few. Start here. Could you talk about how um, uh, how important the branding is internally for uh, the team versus externally for customers and people that are going to buy the product? Um, I think. How would I do it? It's, it's equal as if not more greater to have the internal team understand it more. Um, and I think that's, again, why we quite often get asked whether you just work with the marketing department. So actually, HR is, and is probably one of the first kind of teams that you want to kind of work with to understand how do we kind of drive the culture, change the culture, build upon the culture. And it's vital, like I showed there in the end, if, they, if people don't really believe in it or understand it, then they're not going to be able to deliver it through, through their role. And it's every single role, every single role within the business. Um, you know, even the person that's on a storefront or on a reception desk has to kind of really interpret the brand when they greet someone or somebody meets them. So everybody has to buy into it. So I'd actually say that's possibly more important than how you then deliver it externally because you need those people on board first. Um, when you talked about distinguishing Airbnb to its competitors, you talked about home array, but when you described the core values, it kind of sounded like couch surfing too. If they were there as well at the beginning. Yeah. So that was the core competitor that um, Airbnb identified at the beginning. I think they were the most aggressive. And couch surfing, I think they might have even talked, I don't know if, if what they were doing about them, but that, that again was somebody that started and I think they just wanted to kind of beat them in the race again by shifting their messaging away from what couch surfing was. But they were definitely there in the competitor set as well. And how did you distinguish couch surfing from that? Again, it's the same thing. You know, the, the idea of belonging was, was very different to what couch surfing were doing. They were in the similar space to where Airbnb were at the beginning, you know, it was about, and I think a lot of people did see it as a cheap alternative to travel or a way that you could um, find kind of like different places to stay, etc. And couch surfing, you know, in a way has that kind of aspect of like you do stay with somebody and they can do it, but they've never really wrapped it up as like, this is what we kind of stand for. And this is what we really believe in fundamentally. It was more about value, etc. So um, really it was just encapsulating that from Airbnb's point of view, talking about it to the world, and then really it's then defensible. If couch surfing try and come in and say it, again, it's not gonna be an authentic thing, it's just gonna be trying to, me too, et cetera. Do all charts of companies we then looked at, like the ones you showed? Do what, sorry? All, all charts of the companies we went and looked, do all like, of them like, look like this? Only the ones I show. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, let me think. I don't know. So I, I mean, we pull out the kind of like the core jobs that people kind of talk about and the people who ask us to kind of look at their metrics. Predominantly, yes. And I think it's because, you know, we, we are very lucky that we have worked with some incredible brands and so that in attracts some incredible brands. I think the one that stands out from there, it'd be really easy, I think, to show an, uh, Deliveroo, an Airbnb and potentially a Premier League. The one that I love is the Logitech one because that was going the other way. And so for me, I see that as a bigger challenge. You know, it's kind of a more exciting challenge for me. It's quite easy to just wrap up the very excitement of an exciting brand and tell the world about it. It's very hard to change a company that had been through a rebranding process three times, had lost its way, nobody really wanted to work there, et cetera, et cetera. To change that uh, and work with the CEO to completely change the business was really exciting. So I'll have to dig out. I'll see if I can find any in the opposite way, but I won't share them. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. And if you do, 
So, yeah, this is another kind of myth, I think, that a lot of clients come in and think we then we're definitely going to change the logo. If you think about the Champions League, we didn't touch the logo at all. I think that's something else that we put through the filter. Um, we shouldn't just come in with a predetermined set of things that we're going to definitely change. We need to prove really why it has to change. And that's only if we get to a proposition that it's not really helping us articulate, et cetera. So, um, the first the question should come to is, I always tell the clients that really it should be my job to prove to them why something needs to change rather than just like changing it and saying we, we've looked at it and we want to do this. So really it's our job to kind of show the reasons, the data, et cetera, why something's not working before we change it. Because I say really for me, the logos, it doesn't really matter what they are, what form they are, actually it's just everything else you do that then that logo stands for. That's what I mean, I think the Nike logos, the Apple logos, people just see them as the most beautiful things on the planet because in, in our world because of what they stand for, not necessarily what they are. Would you say this year is changing for the name? So Nike America could be uh, a good name. Yeah, I do. I think it's the same thing. I mean, that's why I think Airbnb is a great example. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't stand up to what the business is. It means air bed and breakfast, and, and that doesn't make any sense. But again, uh, there's lots of brands actually when you look out there that the names, even though they potentially do something like Nike's is Greek God, etc., cetera, uh, Google's, the, I can't remember. You guys will know. Um, but, you know, you don't actually, a lot of people don't understand what they mean, but then they mean something very different because they represent that brand. So, again, I think it's a what you build into it rather than what it actually, it actually means. Personal question, what is the brand you admire most? Because you think, okay, brand I admire most. I would have loved to work for them. Hmm. Uh, so there's a few, actually. Um, and one is, I think, I, there's a one that's I think is really delivering on the idea of purpose at the moment, and that's somebody like Patagonia, who is really, um, showing how a big purpose can drive, drive a brand and drive it to kind of mean something so much more by having this idea that like, actually we don't want to sell you more jackets, we want you to have this one jacket, come to us, we'll fix it, we believe in reducing sales, etc. So, and that's building a fancy brand. I love seeing how that's changing through everything they're doing, which is, which is kind of relatively new and a great case study. There's a brand I admire who take, I think, meaningful difference on that level through absolutely everything they do um, is Disney. I don't think I've ever seen a brand, and I love it, you know, a, a brand that stands for, for basically kind of um, for magic, for kind of telling the world's best stories. Um, they're in opposition to kind of like uh, sadness. And, and, and they've managed to build that into absolutely everything you do. If you go to a Disney park, they're trying to now eradicate having to use money because using money makes you think of sad times of like I'm actually spending money. They're trying to like eradicate that from their parks, which is probably, you know, a little bit uh, unethical. But actually, they're trying to remove everything that makes you think about the real world and the kind of like, you know, the, the bad points about it through absolutely everything they do. Uh, and I think they've done that through digital applications, through taking to the films and then into the real world. Like you, you can. And they've done it for decades. The fact that you have um, bins in, in the parks in Disneyland, do you know about this? So, I don't know if you've ever been, I have kids, so I have been, and I actually just marvel at the efforts they go to. They've been to, they have a spotless, but they also have shoots that when you put the litter in, it doesn't just fill up a sack, it drops straight through to a network of tunnels underneath. And that's because Disney don't want you to see someone carting around litter in their parks. Because again, it's, that's not magical. I don't want to see someone pushing kind of litter around. And that's why they have worked out the p exact distance to put their litter bins as well be between all the stalls. So you never go more than a certain amount of distance between a litter bin so that never should you be like, I've got to carry this around and put it on the floor. You will always have a bin in sight. Now that is taking for me brand and purpose and, and your proposition, what you believe in, through absolutely everything. So it's, it's a fantastic brand. Um, we have been talking about a lot of consumer brands. What about uh, B2B brands? So do you think the same thing applies also in the B2B? Yeah, a, a lot less. And I think it's, you know, we don't work with loads and loads of B2B brands. And I think that's because, you know, they themselves see it as like it's completely different worlds. And, and whenever we have worked with B2B brands, we have to really kind of re-educate them that we're still dealing with humans. We're not just dealing with robots and machines. And I think the ones that do understand that, so if we look at somebody like Salesforce, for example, they're really big advocates of brand. And actually their messaging in their advertising is is quite different. There was one recently that was really based around love of a product. Really, really strange for the, for the product that they have. But um, yeah, I don't think there's as many in that space that understand brand as well uh, because they see it as much more of a function um, and, and they, they for, therefore don't need it. But I think the ones that are really successful actually do understand it. So, so you would say that it has also a similar effect uh, 
So like changing the brand or refining? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I think uh, elevating themselves from competition, cr creating the right culture, more potentially on that side of things than than the you know as as we kind of focus on the customers and what they understand and the role they play in the customer's mind. But there's still people that we are dealing with, and that's what we have to understand. It's like even though it's it might be a marketeer, it might be someone in a certain department, it's still a person that's got to make a choice, uh, and and brand can really help with that. Oh, yeah. Which is the, the brand you love, you don't love, but you need most. But this will be off topic, off topic or off record, because we will have a get together afterwards. You can tell me then. Um, I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, so thank you for this talk. It was impressive. It was energizing. I think I will wander around for the next weeks and, and uh, think about brands. I think they think do a meaningful difference. Yeah, like, do. What's the brand identity? think they really do it. I, uh, I told you I did some brand management before. Mm. In my former life, I think it was much of a top-down process. That's, I think, what, uh, what brand management often is. So yeah. You know, CEO tells people what to do, and the customers don't love it. So uh, it might be an explanation why it fails. Mm -hmm. So I think we learned a lot of in this talk. And you're, of course, welcome to join us for beer or mate or whatever uh, any of you like. And we will have another startup talk in November with uh, N26. So um, I hope you will join us uh, in November for the next startup talk. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to Berlin, to Potsdam for the first time. And I hope it made a good impression on you. And uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Thanks.